Hi, welcome to our talk on designing accessibility for individuals. I'm Karen Ng. I'm a designer on the material design team, and I'm excited to share the work we've been doing to make the design system more accessible. Whether you're new to the fundamentals of accessible design or looking for ways to broaden up access to more people using your product, we hope you'll walk away with resources and best practices for crafting more accessible experiences. Hi, I'm Julia Thelman. I'm a researcher on material. I'm excited to share our research learnings that went into improving our accessibility and inclusivity. Last year, we introduced Material U, which explores a more humanistic approach to design, one that celebrates the tension between design sensibility and personal preferences. We talked about how the one-size-fits-all approach can feel impersonal and how we set out to evolve material design to empower individual identities by enabling product expressions that are as varied as people's behaviors, needs, and desires. People often customize their environment in the physical and digital worlds with images that are personal and provide comfort and joy. We built upon this insight to generate unique material palettes for everyone, derived from a personal signal, their wallpaper, that can be applied across an entire experience. Dynamic Color derives individualized color palettes from a person's wallpaper photo, and it enables people to personalize their experience more than they've ever been able to. A user's wallpaper selection is the basis for our color extraction algorithm to build a color scheme that's applied across a user's device and any apps that accept dynamic color. The system picks colors from a person's wallpaper image and translates a hue into tonal ranges. Then, the extracted color is applied across our components. However, with so many potential color combinations used in dynamic color, a level of unpredictability is introduced to the system. Plus, with our library of components, we needed to think about how we might be able to introduce the dynamic nature of unique schemes generated based on a wallpaper while maintaining accessibility and usability. We recognize that the responsibility of meeting contrast ratio needs shouldn't fall on the shoulders of designers or developers using the system. So we work to identify what we could leverage in color to provide sufficient contrast, regardless of the dynamically generated color schemes. We wanted to come up with an automated way to determine what part of color could help us meet contrast reliably in a world that's dynamic and full of variability. So we dug into color theory a bit more to identify what levers we could work with to achieve contrast in a dynamic and variable system context. As you may know, WCAG has established color contrast ratio requirements of four and a half to one for regular size text against the background, and three to one for measuring non-text contrast of meaningful or active components against adjacent colors. These foundational requirements help ensure UIs are perceivable and distinguishable by people with a visual impairment. I'll share some behind the scenes work that the material team did to incorporate these foundational requirements into our design system in a systematic way. We dove into color theory and observed that tone or the amount of light passing through is currently the way contrast ratios are measured. And tone is a value that can be measured repeatedly. So by calculating tone rather than hue or chroma, we can reliably determine which color pairings will work together to achieve desired contrast ratio levels. With our color system, where each slot in the palette also equates to a step change in tonal value, we can identify the difference in contrast ratios simply by calculating the difference in tone. Here, you can see a range of tones of one color. And in this example, a difference of 40 in tone guarantees a contrast ratio that's greater than or equal to 3 to 1. And a difference of 50 in tone guarantees a contrast ratio greater than or equal to 4.5 to 1. 
You're probably wondering, well, that's just for one color scheme, right? Actually, it works across all our color schemes because again, every color scheme utilizes the same underlying tonal framework. That's what enables a difference of 50 in tone for these examples to both generate a contrast of four and a half to one or more. So even though wallpapers are different from person to person, the end experience is one that meets contrast ratio standards. The tonal system is central to making any color scheme accessible by default. The components are also map-specific roles as well, so that the tone relationships can support contrast needs. Combining color based on tonality is one of the key systems that make any color output contrastful. This relational system of leveraging tones to meet desired ratios, plus creating a structured way to apply color roles to components, enables us to address contrast ratio requirements in a systematic fashion. In this highly dynamic world, contrast is an important thing to get right. Not just the contrast of text on fills, but also non-text contrast, or the contrast of elements such as fills of containers, against another color layer. I'll pass this over to Julia, who's going to share new research that's informed our approach to contrast. Karen just spoke about how the color system works and making the design system more accessible. One of the first assumptions we wanted to evaluate with research was whether meeting three to one contrast should always be required. Remember, as Karen explained, non-text contrast is the contrast of elements such as fills of containers against another color layer. I'll walk you through some research we conducted to understand when components need to meet non-text contrast passing through to one. While WCAG defines certain situations where non-text contrast is required, we wanted to identify the situations where WCAG doesn't necessarily require three to one, but the context could actually benefit from it. Here are some contexts we tested that either pass or fail three to one contrast. On the left, you can see the designs for the navigation indicators that we tested. If you look at them from top to bottom, some are passing and some are failing three to one contrast. We tested color fill and outline failing and passing three to one contrast. In the examples on the right, you can see the variations we tested for inactive state buttons. Again, some passing three to one and using a color fill or outline. We also tested variations of the floating action button, ones that pass and ones that fail three to one contrast. We tested with color fill and also included a shadow. And we repeated this for the buttons on the right as well. Using the design variations, we asked participants to complete easy and quick tasks. In this study, we measured the response time, how quickly it took to complete these tasks, and we also measured accuracy in completing these tasks. We gave participants the same easy and quick prompts, but varied whether the element passed or failed three to one contrast. Participants started the trial by clicking the green dot at the center of the screen. An example of a quick prompt they completed was to tap where you would to write an email. About 687 users were included in the data after cleaning. We included a range of people with different vision experiences, including people with colorblindness or low vision. We also included individuals with varying degrees of assistive tech use. Again, this research wanted to identify the situations where WCAG doesn't necessarily require three to one, but the context could benefit from it. From this study, three key considerations emerge as three things to consider that will allow you to determine if three to one contrast will be beneficial for your users. We will dive into each of these three next. The first key consideration is that components that are grouped together may benefit from three to one contrast. Examples could include inactive state buttons and navigation indicators. The second one is that components that are independent and prominent may not benefit from three to one contrast. Some of the reasons that this may be the case could be because of the location and size of the element. And that leads us to the third key consideration stemming from this research. Components within a UI should maintain a balance. The components can be emphasized with design characteristics such as contrast, hue, size, while taking into account the entire UI to ensure that the overall UI has its intended impact. Let's consider human attention. For example, very bright buttons or a giant button will first be noticed, but may also be out of balance within the UI. We need to think about whether it makes sense for it to pop 
in that way, given the intent of the UI. Also note that as you increase noticeability of all the elements, the UI would be overwhelming, and what you intended to be noticeable may not be noticeable at all. And now I'll pass it back to Karen to talk about some of the design principles. Thanks, Julia. This is the first time we're sharing this work with anyone, and I'm excited to tell you about this new resource that's available now in our guidance. Material U set out to enable systematic product design that's as varied as people's behaviors, needs, and desires. And we've kept building on this goal to create personal, accessible design. To provide a framework and structure towards how app makers can build inclusive, equitable experiences, we put together a set of principles that can guide process and decision making. First, Consider learning about what people need before defining a solution. Formal and informal research can open new ways of thinking, reduce biases, expand perspectives, and encourage creative ways to make access available, especially to those who fall outside prevailing norms. Publicly available resources are often generalized and abstracted in order to suit the broad needs of populations of people. While it's good to start with the publicly available accessibility resources online, consider whether you can conduct research with the people you want to learn from. Apply to the context of your product or feature. You can scale this work up and down depending on your resources. Next, working within minimum requirements established by industry standards is a way to ensure equal access for all. Rather than viewing these requirements as a constraint to what we can or can't design, consider them as a creative opportunity. Think of this as an opportunity to challenge common assumptions and conventions and push outside the box to design for a variety of human experiences. Last but not least, it's important to recognize that needs and wants can differ between individuals. It's part of what makes us unique too. Honoring individuals and their multidimensional wants and needs and abilities is critical for inclusive user experiences. Industry accessibility requirements are often a minimum standard, so consider making the choice to raise the bar by not simply meeting just the minimum, but providing people an experience that's flexible and customized, especially since we've now established that there isn't a one-size-fits-all, nor one default that works for everyone. I hope these principles helped expand your awareness towards designing for the diverse needs of individuals. You can read more about our principles at material.io. Material is a large system with many components, which we want to apply contrast learnings to and provide more flexible support towards. Where we started with was one of the most widely used components, switches. I'll turn it back over to Julia to talk more about switches. Thanks, Karen. I'm gonna run through some of the research we conducted on switches. We wanted to know what makes a switch look on or off. Without clicking on it, when you just look at it, what makes it appear as on or off? More specifically, is it the color of a switch? Maybe the position. Is it having a check or an X mark? And how does the theme play a role in all of this? For the study, we had our participants fill out a survey where they made quick choices on whether or not a switch looked on or off. We tested 48 switches, so 24 zipper and 24 pill switch styles, each with different design features. What we varied was color, position, signifier, meaning check or X, and theme. Let's go into some of the details around our study participants. There were about 197 participants in the study, about 25% had low vision, and about 10% were older than the age of 50. We had three main findings from the study. The first one is that it didn't matter whether the switch was a pill or a zipper style in terms of understanding whether it was on or off. Importantly, in our collaboration with design, we discovered that the pill design can actually more reliably meet three to one contrast requirements. The second finding is that color was the most important thing in letting a user know if a switch was on or off. And finally, the third finding was that having a check versus X mark doesn't make a big impact on whether a switch is perceived as on or off. This is because the users seem to really rely on color. 
I just want to show you a small piece of the data. When only looking at color, holding location and signifier constant, and here you can see they both point in the right direction, blue is perceived as on more often. When only looking at color again, holding location and signifier constant, and here they both point in the left direction, blue is perceived as on more often again. This shows us that blue, as a signifier, is more informative than location, given that within the US, left usually means the switch is off. And so again, the main takeaways here is that color is important, and more important than location and letting a user know that a switch is on. We need to get color right. And two, check versus X signifier is less important because users so often are relying on color to know if a switch is on or off. We came up with a lot of explorations for switches, ranging from zipper, pill, hybrid, shape changes, and more. With that, I'll pass this over to Karen to share more about the newly updated designs. Without further ado, let's take a look at the new accessibility forward redesign of switches. Julia mentioned how important color is to the switches. So, in our redesign, we worked to make sure color would consistently meet contrast ratio requirements, particularly in the world of dynamic color. Having the handle live within the track made it more possible to consistently satisfy non-text contrast requirements because this simplifies the design. Because now, we only have two layers of contrast ratios to meet the track versus the background of the UI, and the handle versus the track. And to support individual needs in various contexts switches are used in, we've updated switches to provide greater flexibility of the option to include an icon for both on and off states. In addition to the icon option, for the off state, the switch looks very different than the on state. Elements such as a change from a fill track to an outline track also help provide an additional cue to people to help signal a difference between the two states. And of course, the color is different for on and off, with the color for on being more colorful and vibrant and the off more muted. Applying our accessible color framework to the color of the switches helped us meet the requirements between these various layers. Let's dive a bit deeper into this. The track versus the background, the handle versus the track, and the icon versus the handle all exceed a three to one contrast ratio. In the off state, the outline against the UI background and the outline versus the switches track all exceed three to one. And the handle also passes against the track. Icons can also be used to communicate the switch's state. Adding in cues like icons may better support those who don't rely on color to distinguish states. A switch is successfully toggled when the switch handle slides to the other side of the track upon interaction. When a user interacts with a switch, its handle size changes and the corresponding action takes effect immediately. The left demonstrates interaction behavior when a cursor is used to interact with the switch, and the right shows the behavior when someone interacts by hand, such as on a touch screen. In the on state, the handle color changes and grows just a bit upon interaction to indicate responsiveness to the user input. Once the handle arrives in the off state, the handle shrinks using size as an additional way to convey on and off state differences. With the Switches case study, we showed you how we prioritize accessibility from the start of this redesign, learn from people through user research, and work to understand industry requirements that spurred creative opportunities. Our research took us from the old switches on the left to the more accessible switches on the right, making the overall switches more accessible than before. As a quick recap, 
we made several improvements to the switches. Since getting color right was important, we made sure to use color to convey on and off states. Meeting multiple layers of contrast proved difficult with the original switch. So we reevaluated it from the ground up. With this new switch architecture on the right, we're able to ensure contrast is met. However, we ensure that we didn't rely on color as the only sensory to convey state change information, but also utilize size differences, fill versus outline styles, and the option to include icons as an alternative way to convey information. Check out goo.gle slash m3 dash a11y for a blog post rounding up all the accessibility resources we share today. We hope you find this talk helpful and inspirational. Thanks for tuning in. Mm-hmm.